Recovering Fundamentalist podcast begins in three. These podcasts, <laughs> podcasts, that sounds like a conviction of beans or peas to me. I, podcast. Listen, in these Recovering Fundamentalists, they don't know the Bible either. What are the fundamentals? Inerrancy, virgin birth of Jesus Christ, Amen. substitutionary atonement, Amen. bodily resurrection Amen. of Christ, and the authenticity of miracles. Hi, man! Two. I am not a recovering fundamentalist. They're everywhere. They're all over the internet. They want to be, uh, what do they call it? Recovering from fundamentalism. They're everywhere. And I think to myself, well, you were just stupid to begin with. And if there's such a word, you're stupider now. We well, you ain't recovering from nothing, good neighbor. We're reviving from the Holy Ghost. Somebody say, man, rock Everybody wants to focus on recovering. Oh, you're recovering. Oh, you need yeah. help. You need therapy. You're recovering. Let's focus on fundamentalist. We're recovering fundamentalism back from people who have hijacked it. We are biblical Phew. family. We are the fundamentalist. Man. That'll make a Baptist want to speak in tongues right there, boys. One. I'm going to tell you one thing. Uh, we better stay uh, in the old paths. Uh, but what are the old paths? I, I've, I've heard that my whole life, and nobody's ever been able to tell me what the old paths or the old time religion really is because it's whatever era you mm-hmm. overly romanticize in your mind as being when the church was it? right. Mm. Like it, lump it, pump it, jump it, take it across the street and dump it. We've raised a generation that is ashamed of our forefathers and act like they were somehow done wrong in the way they were brought up and they were damaged and they were scarred because they were raised in a home that had standards and convictions and kept them on the old time way. You got their number, boys. Y'all thought you started the podcast. You went and started the movement. Thanks for joining us for the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. Make sure to stay tuned at the end of the show to hear more about the RFP sponsors. Now, here's your host for the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast, Nathan Cravat, J.C. Groves, and Brian Edwards. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. We're your hosts, Brian, Nathan, JC. We got Tommy and Kyle back with us again this week for episode 152. 152. I left that off, and uh, we're glad that you're here with us. Uh, Guys, we had a great conversation last week, and we want to pick right back up uh, where we left off last week. And uh, we talked about a lot of the issues that we're dealing with in our culture today. It's not just a teenager's problem. It's a cultural problem. It's this problem of mental health, um, struggling with suicidal thoughts with suicide. Um, There's so many messages that are coming at us all the time. It's hard to figure out what is truth. And that's what we talked about uh, last week. And uh, you guys were able to sit down and have a conversation uh, with a acquaintance of mine, a friend of yours uh, by the name of Eric Garner. And uh, I'm I'm interested before we jump into that video, um, if y'all will just kind of talk about the cultural things that you're seeing right now um, that a lot of these students are dealing with uh, with mental health and suicidal thoughts and and kind of what's causing that. Yeah, well, I, I think there's a, a lot of, there's a lot causing it, which is part of the problem. There's not, it's very difficult to say there's one thing causing it. There's a lot of different things, certainly. Uh, and, and there's data that backs up the, since the use of smartphones and social media you can watch the curve and then the the suicide follows that so but even inside of that there's a lot of different reasons for that um so i don't there's not a great answer for necessarily what's causing it but what we do know for sure is that students are struggling uh and it's a suicide's the the number two cause of death for students right now which um i mean that's so tragic sad. tragic um when we were looking at you know what how what, what should we talk to students about it's like well there's a ton of relevant topics but there's only one that's literally taking the lives of students and so it was a difficult conversation um it was it was it was it was very challenging 
but we felt like it, literally to save lives, we need to have this conversation. We need to, we need to help these hopeless students find hope. And so, um, I don't know if that answers your question, JC, but yeah, yeah there, there's so many students that are asking key questions like, will I measure up? Will I ever be enough? Can I make it? And what happens if I don't make it? And so we wanted to be able to, to try to speak into that hurt with, with hope uh, as so many are looking for. So. so in our local area, we've had several young people take their lives. Uh, some people that I know, as a matter of fact, just a little while back, uh, guys, I didn't even get to share this with you, but late one night, my phone rings. It's a mother who's screaming. Um, I went, I was, she was begging, just come over to our house. Please come over to our house. It's horrible. And then she started saying her son's name. He's gone. He's gone. Um, I get in the car, drive over to the house. It's incredibly late. I was there till the wee hours of the morning and their young son, who was an incredibly handsome kid, uh, just a great kid had, had taken his life. So how can parents be in tune with their children to know whether their, their suicidal conversations, their depression, their anxiety rises to the level of, okay, we've got to do more than just pray prayers with them. And we've got to do more than just point them to some verses. This, this is serious. A lot of the students that I talk to, um, they want to know that they have a place of safety to display who they are, uh, even if it's ugly. And sometimes uh, those of us in the church, sometimes really to our shame, those of us in leadership ministry positions haven't given our kids the allotment to be a little ugly sometimes and to mm. not have it all together. And so there's, there's sometimes, and I, I'm not going to say this in every situation, but there's, there's some of these situations where the parents will say things like, I never knew this about them. And well, be, you know, are we, are we creating safe places where kids can ask questions or share hurts or share experiences or, or talk through things and, and not have to feel like, I said it right, or I had it all figured out. I, I remember, guys, one day I was driving my two daughters home from, from youth group, and I said, uh, hey, girls, I, I'm so thankful for you and your willingness to let your dad be in ministry. And uh, I just wonder, what what's the hardest thing, or what's one of the hardest things? And my oldest, who's a little bit of a perfectionist, she said, I'm afraid that I'm going to do something that's going to bring you shame. Mm -hmm. And I said, sweetheart, that's you don't need to own that. Yeah. You don't need to own that. And, um, and if I can just be transparent a little bit, I, I had to reevaluate re some different things that I was doing and that I was saying that, that created that false expectation in my daughter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Guys, one of the surprising things about mental health and depression and suicide is that in the IFB cultures that we grew up in, a lot of times it's it's diminished. It's brushed off to the side. And I've literally heard people say, you don't need medicine, bless God. You just need to get your heart right yes, or you just pull yourself up by your bootstraps or whatever, drag yourself out of that pit. Well, that explains how little they understand about theology because we live in an extremely broken fallen, sin-cursed world, and it affects everybody differently. S Satan's so smart and sin is so seductive that he can take one person and turn them incredibly confident, incredibly proud, incredibly arrogant, the life of the party, the party animal, and he can get them to hell that way. He could take another person in the same experiences and turn them to emptiness and brokenness and depression, not to mm. mention there are mental things, there are chemical things that play into this. We can break our arm. We can break our minds. It's it's part of the human physiology. So it, it was really frustrating growing up and even hearing it today, people that just minimize it or these clowns that get on line and say things like, well, there's no such thing as autism. That's just demon possession. Give me a break. Like it's yeah. time to have more intelligent conversation beyond that. 
biblical conversation, theological conversation. And I want to personally thank you. I've watched this video. You guys absolutely tackled this issue with courage, with passion, and in a gospel-centered way. So, so thank you. Nathan, thank you for what you just said. You know, I tell people all the time, your heart can get sick, your lungs can get sick, your kidneys can get sick. Your brain is an organ. It is a body organ. In the same way other organs get sick and diseased, your mind can get sick and diseased. You know, I really believe, Nathan, what God just led you to say gave legitimacy to a lot of people. And um, I'm grateful that I just just heard you share that. Yeah. Mm. Don't be afraid to get help. I think that also, on the other hand, in our culture, going to see a counselor was below us. Uh, like, you, you just need to, you know, what you said, Nathan, verbatim, pick yourself up by the bootstraps and press on. And, you know, I mean, I was almost 40 before I sat down in a counselor's office and having a conversation with a guy. And I was like, why didn't I do this years before? It, the, the, mm. Just to be able to talk and to communicate. And the other side of that was being intentional with the people in my life. You know, Kyle, how you just said, you know, having that conversation with your daughter and changing some things. There are people in our life. I, I had a really good friend. He was our lead uh, guitar player at church. We're whitewater rafting the Nata Haley on Saturday, laughing harder than we've ever laughed. He took his life on Sunday. I never saw the signs, never knew that there was anything going on with that. And I said, how did Chris, how did I miss it? And what that's done for me is, is really just it's put something in me to be more intentional, to ask more questions, deeper questions, to listen to the answers a lot more than just surface level. And I think sometimes, you know, growing up right now, I've got, you know, a, a 13 year old, an 11 year old, a 10 year old, a six, five, a four, a three, two. I got all these kids that are growing up. My son, 13 years old, and he's, he's starting to get teenager and distancing. And I'm like, man, I, I want to make sure that I'm asking such good questions that isn't pushing him away, but drawing him in and just stay keeping my finger on the pulse, if you will, of that. And so, you know, I think sometimes it is scary and it's okay to not know what to ask, but to just do it in a genuine heart. And I think sometimes it's better to ask a dumb question than no questions at all. And some of the parents that are listening are terrified to talk because they're like, well, what if they think that it's a stupid question? Well, I'd rather you have asked that and save your kid's life than not. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. One of the things about, go ahead. I was just going to say, one of the things Christy talks about in the the video is just being present, practicing yeah. presence. And I would say to parents, um, you don't have to know what to say. You know, it, it, literally just being present and, and sitting with your, your, you know, child in that really just gives them, you just recognizing that they're struggling, that they're feeling the way that they feel just will go so far. Yeah. And I think sometimes, you, you know, my, my kids are young, but I think I, I have observed sometimes there's this fear of that. And we feel like we got to fill it with, we, we, you know, we got to just instantly respond with the truth and we got to, you know, just, you know, rush in with the solution. And I would say, I think a lot of times we need to, to, just be present first mm -hmm. and uh, just be there. And in time, you'll have the opportunity to lead them uh, to the truth. But just being present is so powerful. Mm -hmm. So let's set this video up that we're getting ready to watch and listen to. Um, Y'all recorded this. And uh, this past summer, you showed this to thousands of students every week at Word of Life Florida, New York, and, uh, and then followed it up with a very intentional uh, time of giving students an opportunity to respond. And the response was incredible. We were talking about that a little bit before we started recording, just who it was. There was no pattern of who was responding to this popular jock, uh, you know, book nerd, you name it. Across the board, they were responding leaders. Um, and uh, so set up the the video that we're getting ready to listen to and to watch and introduce us to Eric, his story and, and this opportunity that y'all had. So this story kind of uh, was was started uh, for me back summer 1999 uh, when I met Eric uh, on World Life Island and um, began a friendship with him. And um, then as I was getting my degree, I, I 
started to have more of a discipleship, mentorship, accountability relationship with him. Uh, he stepped into ministry. Er Eric grew up um, as a ministry kid. Uh, he had a desire and a passion to go into ministry and to serve the Lord. He actually at one point wanted to be an orthodontist, which I always thought was the craziest thing, but but uh, wanted, to, wanted to go into ministry and just had a passion for people, had a passion to see people come to know Jesus Christ and have a real authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, but Eric didn't do a good job processing the stuff that he was going through. He, he like so many of us in ministry, had a heart to help other people and really just didn't create that community space for himself. Um, well, it, and it, we mentioned this briefly in the, in the video, but it's so hard if you're a pastor. Oh man. Or a, a ministry leader. You know, how how do you there's it, fe it feels like you have to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And I think that was and interestingly enough, and I I'd mentioned this again in the video, but Eric uh he he had been going through a lot of stuff. Um and he, he called me almost exactly a month before he took his life. And he said can you help me tell my story? Hmm. Specifically, his heart was to help other people in ministry because he, he saw, he had been through the, the ringer of I'm called to ministry and I'm struggling and there's just no space for me to struggle hmm. and serve God. Like I'm, I, you know, he was just kind of cast out of that. And he so he he called me and he's like I'm willing to I'm willing to put my life out there and talk about my struggles because other people need help with this mm -hmm. specifically people in ministry who are struggling with things like addiction that was that was a struggle for Eric and something that he had a passion for to help people who were struggling with addiction um, and then mental health and and suicidal thoughts and that you know that conversation with Eric, he called me and asked me and I said, I would love to help you with that. Um, and I never got to make the video with him. Um, but then this last year, we had the chance to make this video that for me was a very healing thing to be able to keep that commitment um, and to help him do um, <clears throat> to help him do what what he wanted to do, which was help people use his story to help other people. Yeah. I, uh, um, I made a promise to his wife at, uh, at his funeral that, uh, that the heart of Eric, uh, as it says in Hebrews, the blood of Abel still speaks that the heart of Eric and the passion of Eric, uh, to see people have safe places to go. I've got problems. I'm messed up. I don't have it all together. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. Uh, I need help. And I, and I don't feel like I can call out to anybody. And so many of them, so many of them, I believe there's even people listening to this right now are in ministry and you're playing the pretending game as, as if you have it all together. And it's only ruining the ministry in your life. And it's going to end up affecting, affecting your ministry to other people's lives. You don't have to have it all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I made a promise to, to Chrissy that day that, that I would do whatever I could to make sure that Eric's heart, Eric's uh, passion, not his message, because Eric made sure his message was always Jesus. Yeah. And I, and that was one thing I always appreciated about him, but that, um, that the message and the hope of Jesus would, would still speak. And, um, and so it, it, it was a joy. It was a hard, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hard couple of days. And I don't think we anticipated that we were going to have to get up every single week of the summer uh, and mm. yeah, essentially, you know, preach afterwards. Uh, yeah. Um, that, yeah. Mm. I remember on the flight there, I was like, why did we do this? <laughs> I remember calling Tommy up before the first week and going, cause our, our camp starts a week or two before his and going, dude, I've thought about this. I've thought about this. What do I say to these kids? I'm just, yeah. I, I, I feel like, and he was like, okay, well, let's talk about it. And it was a great, just kind of conversation, uh, to direct the hearts. Um, and even just to talk to Chrissy and yeah. to, to have her heartbeat. I actually one week got, she traveled down to Florida and she and I together, uh, mm -hmm. after, after the video got to, um, 
Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Well, Thank I don't know what guys. it went like in Florida, but Tommy, I can, I can tell you, man, it was, um, it was powerful. You honored your friend well, and yeah. you did a good job, um, talking about the Jesus that he loved and, uh, the students sitting in that fine pavilion, uh, just to see the response and to hear the story. Um, it came from a heart of love and it really was portrayed, um, as genuine, uh, to them to, to know that there's hope. And, yeah. And, and you may never know how many lives he saved mm -hmm. by having yeah. his story shared through you guys. So, uh, you, you probably yeah. won't ever see the results of that on this side, but one day you will. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and the video that you guys are going to show, um, both with the outro message and without the outro message, um, is available and it's absolutely free for anybody to, to take and to, uh, to share and to, uh, uh, to continue this message of hope. Where so, can they so. find that? Uh, on the recovering say, fundamentalist podcast. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Right there. Just edit right us right out there. and follow the video. I, I'm going to put it, put it on YouTube as well. I'll be there. Okay. Well, let's jump into today's video. Tommy, Kyle, thanks for being on two weeks with us guys. And uh, we yeah, love you. Thank you for what you're doing. Keep pointing the young people to Jesus. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Thank you. Hi, my name's Kyle Gray. I'm the camp director for Word of Life The Coast down in Florida. This video was filmed with my friend Tommy Sewell, the camp director at Word of Life The Island up in New York. Tommy and I have been friends for a long time, and we were so excited to be able to do this video interview together. We're headed to the great state of Texas, specifically the town of Tyler, to meet up with our friend Chrissy Garland. In order to understand why we're meeting up with Chrissy today, we need to tell you about our friend, Eric. Both Kyle and I were friends with Eric for a long time. For me, it's almost as long as I can remember, as we grew up in the same town and went to the same youth group. I met Eric when I was working on Word of Life Island. God began a friendship built on laughter and being a godly man. Eric always sought to bring humor and Jesus into every conversation. Eric, Kyle, and I all shared a passion for telling others about Jesus, especially at camp. Eric served several summers working on the island and was a frequent speaker, both at the island and the coast. Eric also spent many years serving in the local church in various pastoral roles throughout Texas. He was an amazing children's pastor and a gifted communicator of God's word to children. While attending seminary, Eric met and married Chrissy, and God later blessed them with twins, Joa and Selah. While outwardly, things seemed to be going well. Inside, Eric was struggling. He was battling cancer and had to undergo surgery to remove it. Eric's physical and mental recovery from the cancer surgery led to an addiction to his medication. This addiction also exposed some mental health struggles Eric was facing. Eric fought those battles valiantly and many times seemed to be making great progress. Tragically though, our friend Eric took his own life in January, 2019. Even now, it's hard to believe that it's true. It's definitely not easy talking about. Tommy and I and so many others miss Eric so much. I talked with Eric almost exactly one month before he died. He called me to ask me to help him tell his story. And even though he knew it would be hard for him to talk about all that he had been through, he wanted to help others with their struggles. This is never how we would have wanted to tell Eric's story, but we want to honor his request all the same. And so today we're talking with Chrissy, his widow. She's a licensed therapist and counselor who has some valuable insight for both those who are struggling and for those who know people that are struggling. We want to invite you to listen in on our conversation with Chrissy. And we're praying that God will use it to give grace for the suffering and hope for the battle. Chrissy, as we uh, remember Eric and uh, remember some of our great memories of him uh, in his life, uh, and, and of course also his struggle with mental health, what are some things you think, you know, thousands of high schoolers are gonna be watching this video this summer at the coast, on the island, and what do you think some things are that we can learn from Eric's life, some things that would help these high schoolers? Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing is that 
Eric was in love with Jesus. He loved the Lord, and he had a very close relationship with the Lord. If you knew Eric, that was the number one um, most important thing in his life. And I think that is confusing to people because he did take his life, and, and people don't understand that. But the truth is, is that you can love the Lord. You can have this closer rela- relationship with the Lord, um, but still struggle with things that he struggled with, like depression, anxiety, addiction, mental illness. And I think that was confusing for him, too, but um, that's something that people need to know is that you can have this close relationship with the Lord and still experience these struggles. Um, So that would be the number one thing. I think the second thing is, is that he tried to be very open and honest about these things. And most people in ministry and Christians don't feel comfortable talking about things like, um, I'm depressed and I wanna die some days because it gets so bad. but he tried to, to be open, and a lot of people accepted that and loved him through that, even when they didn't know exactly how to. But then there was a lot of people that turned their backs towards him and didn't know how to talk to him about it, didn't know how to accept it, and left him feeling ashamed of it. And that kind of pushed him back and made him not want to talk about it as much. Um, but he kept trying to talk about it because he knew there were more people who struggled with it. Um, a third thing is just he loved so big, and, and that's what you know from Eric, is he loved big. When I met Eric, he would take Tuesday nights and just go hang out with the homeless in downtown Fort Worth, Texas, um, because he, he loved them so much, and he wanted them to know the love of Jesus. Um, so that's another thing. I think the last thing would be to not give up. And I think if Eric were here, and I wish he were that's what he would be telling people. Don't give up. Um, Because God made you for a reason. God has you breathing for a reason. And his love is unconditional. And that means that his love is big enough for our problems, big enough for our heartaches of this world and our struggles. And as believers, we think like we can't struggle with these things because then we don't have faith. And that's just not true. That is not true. Um, That's part of our broken world. And God's love covers that. And God's love wants to walk alongside of us in that. And we just have to fight for our life and fight to believe that our God is good and that he's bigger than these things that we're experiencing and that we have hope. You uh, you used a couple phrases that I think really jump out. and, And again, maybe somebody watching this has felt some of that. You, you said the confusion. You talked about how sometimes that's confusing for other people to observe Eric and say, wait a second, you, you do love God, you, therefore you shouldn't go through these struggles. You, you talked about how that was confusing for people interacting with him that, that caused them to create some distance. Why do you think, and, and I don't want to label the church, but in our context, we, we interact with people that in the church... It is that confusing thing. Why do you think that it is the way that it is? And what do you think that we could do to make it different or better? You know, this has been a question I've asked myself since seeing Eric struggle, since losing Eric to suicide, um, is that where, what was I missing? What are we missing as a body of believers that we think we have to hide in shame from these things? And I think... For some reason, from a young age, you know, we, we believe that we have to be perfect or we have to be close to perfect to say that we are close to God. Mm. And, and I would say that's a stigma in itself. As Christians, we, <laughs> we're like, our, even though we say it's not about works, our good works will put us in good favor with the Lord and in good favor with other believers. And so it pushes us to hide these things. And, and then we don't create that safe space to like talk about it. So it becomes this stigma of, oh, if we're struggling with these things, especially the bigger sins that we have believed about, depression, suicidal thoughts, things like that, addiction, um, if we believe in, you know, if people know we struggle with these things, then they're going to judge us. So that stigma has been around for far too long um, in the church when in actuality, if we really apply scripture, not just read it, teach it to other people, but actually apply it to our life, 
then we see that everyone in Scripture had these struggles, mm -hmm. and God met them there, and that's when God was intimate, in, intimate and kind and loving, and where we really truly saw the character of God. So it's that stigma that we have to break. I, I think also it, it's, it's pride saying, I can fix it myself. Like, if I am close to God, then I have the ability within me to fix it. And again, if we look at scripture, we see that God is our strength. God is the one that helps us in these times. And we have no problem like teaching about it, but then when it comes to our own lives, you know, we say, no, I should be close enough to God to be able to handle these type of issues. And, and, and lastly, I think it's just fear, fear of rejection, fear of not being accepted. Um, a lot of people in ministry fear their jobs because if, if they admit they're addicted to something, if they admit that they have this internal sadness um, inside of them, and then people will think, oh, they must not know God as well as I know God, or they need to spend more time in prayer, or they need to read more scripture. And, and so people hide in shame out of fear. And that's why this conversation is so important, so that we can break these things, that we can talk about them openly and say, okay, I struggle with depression and I need God in my depression. I need God in my anxiety. I feel like I wanna die today and I need God today. And that's when God just like shows up and says, thank you for calling out to me. Thank you for bringing it to light. And that's how we need to change that in our evangelical circles, in our churches, in our ministries, because then we don't have to hide in shame anymore. I love um, hearing you say that, and we were, we were just talking a few minutes ago, um, and I mentioned it in the introduction that last time I talked to Eric on the phone and him talking about telling his story, and, and I remember thinking afterwards, you know, just how, how courageous that was of him to say, I'm willing to go on record and, and like I'm all s essentially stand in front of the world and say, here's where I've struggled. And even though it's going to be difficult, I'm willing to do it because I want to help other people. And I think that's exactly what you're talking about. I want to ask you to a little bit kind of in part to that conversation and what you mentioned before, because I think part of what made Eric have that desire was he was observing um, probably a lot of it firsthand, but also he could see secondhand too. The church, um, the churches that he was around, having a hard time knowing how to help somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I say the church, but that's all of us, right? So, what are some ways that we can um, help people as the body of Christ who are struggling to feel like not that they're being rejected, but they're that they're being you know received and, and loved well? And that's such a good question that you asked and that we should all be asking as believers is how do we address these issues? Um, the church needs to be on the front lines. Uh, we are the body of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. And we are the ones that are supposed to be a refuge and a safe place for people who are struggling with these things and battling them. And um, I think the very first thing is having the conversation, being brave enough to talk about it. And, and always, t I always say, let's start this conversation. And as ministry leaders, start the conversation. Be bold to be the one to step out in faith and trust that God is going to use it, um, not only in your life, but in the lives of others. So whoever watches this um, and whatever age you are, start the conversation. Make it an important conversation because people, people are lost. People are scared. Um, people are taking their life because they don't know where else to turn. And they think that's the only way. And that is not the only way. And the church has the opportunity to say, okay, we may not know everything about mental illness, but we know the God who does. And we're willing to learn about it. And, and so I think that needs to start with us as believers. If it's us that, that's struggling personally, step out in faith, talk about it, share your story. I say, um, you know, there's, when we are vulnerable, mm. we don't let shame identify us anymore. Right. We actually embrace such an amazing character of God and that is compassion mm. and love and, and saying, okay, 
yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, I struggle with these things, but God, but God is big enough to take them and, and, and to heal it and to, to use our brokenness, our broken stories uh, to bring about glory and power and healing into others' lives. So yes, the church needs to talk about it. Another thing I would say is the ministry of presence. Um, a lot of times it's not that we want to be mean, it's, it's that we don't know how to help someone struggling with this. And so in that case, just being there. And, and Eric always said, ask questions, don't make comments. Just being there and asking the questions of, I don't understand this, help me understand what you're going through. And, and that ministry of presence is so powerful, that community uh, of just saying, I love you and I accept you no matter what you tell me, no matter what you're, you're dealing with. Um, and, and as believers, I think that's important for us to just admit when we don't know, but also educate ourselves to say, I don't know, but I want to know. And scripture, scripture, like I said, talks about all, all these people, our biblical heroes who struggle with these things. And I think we can go to scripture for encouragement, but I think God also provides us with resources. And, and if your pastor doesn't know or your mentor doesn't know how to handle these things, God gives us Christian counselors and different resources that we we can go to. We just need to be brave and start the conversation and share our story. Chrissy, you, you talked several times about having the conversation, which I think is absolutely important. It has to start there. How can somebody maybe sitting there, a youth leader, teenager, knowing their friend is struggling, or maybe they're, they're that person that is struggling, mm-hmm. how do I begin that conversation, not to just lay it on the table, but to offer a place of hope in the midst of that conversation. And I get asked this a lot because I wish I could tell people just to be able to go up to someone and say, hey, I'm struggling with depression and mental illness. Like, (laughs) I wish that were the case, but that's awkward for anyone. Um, But I think it's important for a ministry leader who is listening to this, who is watching this, to know, again, the ministry of presence. I remember someone asked me, what's the best thing I can do for my friend who's struggling? I don't know what to say to them. I say, sit on the bench with them. Mm. You don't have to know exactly what to say. (laughs) Sometimes you may not say anything and it may be awkward, but the fact that you're there, the fact that you show up for them and you're there for them. And for any ministry leader, you don't have to give them advice. Be there for them, be a safe place for them. And, And I'd say that for friends too. Um, shame dies when you're able to tell your story in a safe place. Be that safe place. And if you're the one struggling, find a safe place to tell it. You don't have to put it on social media and announce it to the world. But find someone you trust and that is a safe place and tell them, I'm dealing with this Give it freedom. Don't let it be chained any longer. Give it freedom. And just being there for someone. And if, if, if the leader or the person you go to doesn't know what to do except to be there, then, then ask questions and say, hey, let's go talk to someone who may know how to help you further uh, towards healing. And that's when other resources, there's so many amazing Christian resources out there, faith-based counselors and, and doctors and things that, that can help you as well as pastors and prayer and scripture. And, and you just need to be willing to be present. You, you talked about Eric's big love for people. Mm-hmm. And, and, and all of us saw that through the little things that he did, the big things that he did. Talk, talk to us more about how he used that to be there for others and how we can carry on that same heartbeat. Goodness. I always say the greatest gift that Eric gave me, he taught me selfless love. He just always loved people. He loved me so well. And... He would, all I can think about is the story you told at his funeral. And I hate to turn this back on you. Um, I never had heard that story, but I think it was just the heart of who Eric was. Eric saw people for who they were, 
not by the actions or by their mistakes or... Honestly, he loved the outcasts because mm -hmm. he thought the church, he thought ministry is where they should be. And just because they lived a hard life or made bad decisions didn't mean they were discounted from serving in the church and serving others. And so he went for those people and he believed in those people and he gave his whole heart to those people because he loved God. And I, I, now you're just gonna have to tell the story really quickly because that, that comes to mind almost weekly when it comes to Eric's love. Yeah, so uh, he had just bought this brand new Texas Rangers hat. <laughs> and Eric was a big baseball fan. Mm -hmm. And he loved his baseball stuff. Mm -hmm. And we were riding down in the car. And Eric was also that weird guy that would always talk to the cars around him. And I remember we pulled up to this stoplight. And there was this group of guys in the car next to us that looked a little tough and a little gruff and a little rough. And he just leans over and goes, how you doing tonight? And I'm like, what are you doing? And they kind of sneer at him a little bit. And he goes, no, seriously, how you doing? You guys having a good night? And the one guy goes, a nice hat. And he takes off his hat and he throws it and he goes, this one? And the guy goes, man, this is great. And he goes to throw it back and Eric says, hey, just go ahead and keep it, man. It's just, it's just a thing. It's just a thing, you know. Um, had he had that open door and had that light stayed red a little longer, I know Eric would, the next thing would have been said, I don't live for things. I live for a person. I live for the relationship that Jesus gave because that, that he used everything he could to turn those moments into a, into a Jesus moment. Yes, yes. And some people may look at Eric and see someone, oh, he took his life. Oh, he was a pastor who took his life. Oh, he was someone who struggled with depression and addiction. But I see Eric as a human being just like you, just like me, who gave his entire life to loving Jesus to wanting other people to love Jesus. And I know that he's with Jesus now. I know he's in heaven because even though he struggled with sin, he experienced consequences of sin, and he battled these things at such a deep level, he never doubted God's love for him. And God's love never changed for him. So God loved him just as much as when he was preaching the gospel from the stage as he was in his darkest time, stuck in depression and addiction, crying out to him. That's the same Eric, because God created him and loved him. And that's what people need to know. No matter where you are in life and what you're dealing with, God loves you and will fight for you and will fight for your healing and it's not going to be wasted. And that's what this conversation is about. Christy, as we, as we finish up, um, I know there's statistically going to be a lot of students that watch this that struggle. Mm -hmm. what, what would you say to that? I'd say live. Yeah. Live your life. Because it matters. It matters on your darkest day. It matters on your best day. And when you feel like giving up, Take a deep breath because that reminds you that God created you for a purpose. Um, and I want to share something pretty intimate and, and special that I hope encourages people because before Eric died, he wrote something and I, I, I couldn't give a better word than what he shared. And if it's okay if I, I yeah, share that. Yeah. His prayers with the Lord were just phenomenal to read in his journal. But it goes along with the lines of like, don't give up. Nothing's too dark. Not, you're never too far gone. 
no pain is too great for the healing power of Jesus. You just have to keep fighting. And so he wrote this, and I read it after he had passed, but Eric wrote, the truth is I'm not meant to hide. I'm meant to live in the freedom that the gospel has given me. I know we all wish we could erase some dark times in our lives, but all of our life's experiences, bad and good, make you who you are. Erasing any of life's experiences would be a great mistake. Mis mistakes can be our teacher, not our attacker. A mistake is a lesson, not a loss. It's a temporary and necessary detour, but not a dead end. More than anything, I want my brokenness to enlighten those who find themselves in fear and shame, to be able to see His light, to know that Jesus truly is the great Redeemer and Restorer. I am Eric Garland. I am a person of worth because of what Jesus says, not because of what society labels me. And I just want to say for those who watch this and who struggle with these things and feel lost and hopeless, that they're a person of worth, hmm. not because of what they struggle with and what they'll go through in this life, but because Jesus created them and loves them. And that is the message I hope people get from this. Times like this are, are tough, but they're good. I, I love talking about his life. I love laughing, I love sharing stories. And just, he was a good man and a good friend. I thought the interview was a good reminder too of the power of the gospel. It's unto salvation, but it also sets us free. Free from guilt or from shame. I think that's really important. Yeah, that, that line that she shared, that shame dies when stories are shared in safe places. If anything, if this video can can begin conversations to bring hope where there is shame and, and healing where there's hurt. I, I think that's what Eric would want the message of his life to be because there's such hope found at the cross. Hey, thanks for joining us in the midst of this tough conversation about real things that are going on in many people's lives. Before we continue, I think there's some key truths that we need to talk about. Psalm 46, one through three says this, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, God is there with us in the midst of every problem, in every pain, in every situation with a promise of this. There is always hope and there is always help. Now, let me say this. Suicide is not the answer. It's not a solution and it's not an answer. Substance abuse or, or taking things or doing things to yourself to dull or to numb the pain is not a good solution. It's not an answer. Cutting yourself in any other form of that is not an answer. It's not a good solution. Those things only continue to bring about more pain and more problems, both for yourself and for other people. But if you're struggling, can I tell you, you're not alone. There's a long list all throughout history of people who have dealt with anxiety, depression, mental issues, and the list goes on and on and on. So, so what do we do? What do we do with the story that is Eric's life? And how do we, as I believe we need to do, allow God's word to invade our hurt with hope? Well, a couple different things. First of all, there's nothing wrong with you. God, all throughout his word, talks about how personally he's involved in our creation and in creation itself. But Psalm 139 brings out a, a beautiful truth that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God personally put you together and God doesn't make trash, he makes treasures. 
God never makes mistakes. And so therefore you are not a mistake. Second of all, you're not alone. I know one of the greatest tactics of the enemy, of Satan, is to make you feel like you're the only person that struggles with this. You're the only person in your situation and you're not. You are not alone. God himself promises he will never leave us nor forsake us. So even just based on that truth, you are not alone. Number three, because of Jesus, there is always hope. Romans chapter five talks about how, yes, there are tribulations in this life, but tribulation, when when we walk through it, it produces perseverance and perseverance produces character and character brings about hope. And because of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, we always, always have hope. Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble. You will have hardship. You will have pain, but take heart. I'm greater than all these things. I can give you peace through all these things. But like Jesus said in John, take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus came to bring a hope into the brokenness of our lives. Jesus didn't come to take away all the pain in life, but Jesus came to bring us hope and to leave us the Holy Spirit so that, like we said in the video, that we may have grace for the suffering and hope in the midst of the trial. And I believe that we need to take these truths and remind ourselves of these things to allow hope to invade the hurts in life. I have a good friend of mine that says this, in times of feeling distant from God, the question is not one of proximity to, but awareness of. Can I urge you, can I challenge you to go back, dig into the word and allow the truth of God's word to invade your heart with hope? because we're stuck with this double-sided coin. We have the truth that God is good, but we have the truth that life is hard. And let me say something, people. The truth that life is hard does not cancel out the truth that God is good any more than the truth that God is good cancels out the truth that life is hard. We live in a broken world because of sin. And so because of brokenness, we feel pain, we feel hurt. Unfortunately, we bring that pain and hurt into other people's lives and we experience that. But no matter how much life's hurt comes at us, it will never cancel out the truth that God is good and God wants to reach his goodness and his hope into whatever situation you're dealing with, whatever problem you're you're walking through, whatever storm is raging in your life, the truth, the beautiful truth that God is good wants to meet you right where you are in the midst of your pain. Again, like he says in Deuteronomy, he will never leave us nor forsake us. Like he says in Proverbs, the the name of the Lord is a strong tower and we're called to run to it so that we might find safety. Don't run away from God in the midst of your hurt, run to him. Now, let me say this. If you are hurting, if right now you're sitting there and you're saying, Kyle, I'm dealing with hurt in my life. Can I urge you? Begin a conversation. Talk to somebody. Find somebody that you can talk to, not to just share your problems with, but I urge you to find somebody who is more mature in you in wisdom and in experience. I'm not saying don't talk to your friends, but I'm saying this, find an older, more mature believer who's going to help you to invade that hurt with hope that's gonna take you to God's word, that's gonna listen to you and and, and allow you maybe just to verbally share with them, maybe even verbally explode on them, but they're gonna walk you through, they're gonna meet you right in the midst of that pain but they're more uh, mature in experience and in wisdom. I wanna urge you to go and find maybe a a hope-based hotline, a a, a biblical counselor, a biblical advisor, a a, a trusted counselor that you can go to and and talk through that, that has experience and knowledge in this specific area. I was talking to my friend, Tommy Sewell, the other guy in this video. And when we were preparing for this message series, he said this, he said, Kyle, if I'm looking for God to take away all the problems and all the frustration and all the hurt, I'm looking for the wrong thing and I'm only gonna end up disappointed and frustrated. But if I'm looking for God to give me hope and joy in the midst of my pain, then I can trust his hand no matter what comes my way. And students, I wanna encourage you, when pain comes at you, face the fact that this is a reality of life, but this doesn't have to be the reality that you live in. And you can get hope in the midst of that hurt. You can get help in the midst of that pain. And so I I wanna urge you, seek the scriptures, but seek counsel. 
find somebody that you can talk to again that is older and wiser in you in maturity and in experience. Because we can cling to the beautiful truth that heaven is certain. Praise God that one day we won't have to deal with all this hurt and all this pain. Praise God that one day he will make all things right. And so I believe with all of my heart that scripture positively tells us that if God is big enough and strong enough and good enough to bring us hope one day, then God is big enough and strong enough and good enough to bring us hope today. I believe with all my heart, student, leader, whoever is listening to this and watching this, God wants to bring you joy and peace while you're even still struggling. It's a hard concept sometimes to to embrace, but I believe with all my heart, we see characters throughout the word of God that went through hard things and somehow they had joy. That's not just for the super soldier Christian. I believe that's for anybody who has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, Hope in heaven is not just certain one day, I believe we can live in the reality and the goodness of it today. Does that mean everything is gonna go away and you're gonna, not gonna have any problems? Not at all. Does that mean you're not gonna have any pain? Obviously not. But just like Paul, you can praise in the midst of the prison. You can have joy in the midst of the hardship. You can have trust in the midst of the storm. But praise God, we can cling to the truth that this too will pass And this life is not what it's all about. And one day, because of the hope that is Jesus, we can have the hope that is heaven. So what do we do with all this? Well, I believe we're called to live accordingly. We cannot allow the enemy to take that one moment and have us live our whole life experience based on that. We can't allow him to take our past, to slow our present, and to stall our future. We have to allow the truth of God's word to invade our hurt with hope knowing the truths that God is good, that we're not alone, that there's nothing wrong with us. Yes, we live in a broken world, but God is good and heaven is certain and we can have hope today. You see, I believe like Romans 8 says, that nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And so live in that hope, walk in that hope. Now, let me say this. If you're sitting there right now and you're saying, Kyle, I'm not struggling. Either I'm not struggling right now or I really typically don't struggle with this. How can I help my friend? Can I urge you, give them a safe place to start a conversation. Like Chrissy said, shame dies when stories are shared in safe places. Give them a safe place to share. Urge them to invade their hurt with the hope of scripture. Urge them and encourage them to find a faith-based resource, a, a counselor, you know, things that can help them process through the pain of what they're going through to get that help. I hope your church has a plan and maybe your church does have a plan or doesn't have a plan, but I would encourage the leadership to get together and say, hey, let's review our plan and make sure that it is the best that we can and that people know about it so that they can get hope. But it's so important for you to just sometimes just sit there, maybe not share answers or share your experience, but just listen and pray with them and hear them out. Again, you should know about those hope hotlines. You should know about those those help resources so that you can share with them as well. Chrissy ended her time with us sharing a beautiful saying of Eric, and I would love to end our time sharing something that my dear friend said. He said this, there's nothing wrong with you, and there's nothing that will change God's love for you. We're all broken. It's what you do with that brokenness that matters. Listen, we're praying for you. I'm praying for you as one broken person, praying for other broken people. Let's join together and allow God to display his hope through us, whether we're hurting or we're not hurting. Let's invade this broken world with the truth of the love that is Jesus Christ. Thank you so much.
for listening to the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. Be sure to stop by our social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Give us a follow. Also, go to our website, recoveringfundamentalist.org. That's recoveringfundamentalist.org. There you can find Recovering Fundamentalist swag. You can get your t-shirts and hats. You can join our ex-fundy community. See where we're going to be having some meetups. It's the recoveringfundamentalist.org. Be sure to join us next time for the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast.